Hello and welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Alpena. This is Easter Sunday. The Lord Jesus Christ is risen. Welcome to our service and it is indeed another beautiful day in Alpena, Michigan. Welcome. Welcome to Easter Sunday. Our call to worship. Alleluia, Christ is risen. We come together today to celebrate the rising of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. With hearts raised high, we sing praises to God for what has been done for us. Let us be glad, let us rejoice, for Christ is risen indeed. and ascension into your glorious presence. May the living Lord breathe on us his peace that our eyes may be open to recognize him in breaking the bread and to follow wherever he leads, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. I'll read now a selected verses from Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. The love of God endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my defense. The Lord has become my salvation. Shouts of joy resound from the tents of the righteous. 
The Lord has done mighty things. I will not die but live. I will proclaim what the Lord has done. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done this this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our prayer of confession. All knowing, all powerful God, we confess even on this most holy day, we are unable to fully put our trust in you. Yet we must confess our utter dependence on you not only for life, but also in faith, hope, and love. Without your astonishing appearance to our ancestors and your stunning presence throughout the ages, we would be lost. Forgive and transform us that in every way our work and prayer will make whole what is broken and give peace on earth. Amen. The Assurance of Pardon By the grace of God and the witness of our ancestors, the good news of Jesus, resurrection is our rock and our salvation. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, we are forgiven. six through nine on this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples a banquet of aged wine the best of meats and the finest of wines on this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people the sheet that covers all nations he will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord, we trusted in him. Let us rejoice 
and be glad in his salvation. Our second reading is from the Gospel of John. And it's chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strip of linen, lying there but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, you have carried him away. Tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, to her Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to go to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went into the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This, my friends, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We say these words every Easter. And we pronounce them with joy and meaning as we come face to face with our fellow Christians here in the sanctuary of the church or out in the narthex. We feel joy because of what our Lord has done, but I think it is also the sight of our fellow congregants that puts that tone in our voices and the smile on our faces. At least that's how it is most years. But it has been two years now that we have had only video services for Easter. And so we have not been able to experience that togetherness that we have always had before. But you can imagine it in your mind right now, what it's like, and maybe that longing will magnify when the next time that we are together. Though it is hard for the average American male to say this, a big part of the reason for that uplifting tone and the smiles that we recall from an Easter two years ago when we were all together is the love that we feel for one another. Yes, I said it, I did say it, I said the L word. Just admit it to yourself. You love coming to church. Not just because you love God, but because you love the people you worship with as well. 
Well, sometimes you wonder if it's really everyone, and you probably do not love them as much as you should, but still you love them. And so we celebrate this wonderful day on which we do everything in the traditional way, right? There's Easter eggs, a savory meal, with a sweet dessert. Time is spent with friends and family, catching up on each other's comings and goings and doings, everything since probably Christmas. And then what do we do with the kids? We quiz them on their hopes and their dreams. We are surrounded by flowering bulbs and almost overwhelmed by the perfume of the hyacinths that are in the mix of the bulbs that are placed around the house. But you know, that first Easter day was not much like we think of as Easter. Rather, it was a hectic and perhaps frightening experience for some. In fact, at the end of the Gospel of Mark, when the women among the disciples find Jesus is not in the tomb, they were all trembling and bewildered. And they went out and fled from the tomb because they were afraid. But our reading from the Gospel of John, though not so scary as Mark, also gives us a vision full of surprises and perhaps a little bit of consternation as well. And it contains something else that is remarkable. It is, as William Barclay points out in his commentary, filled with love. The story begins with Mary Magdalene going to the tomb where Jesus had been placed. John does not say why she was there, but the Gospel of Matthew tells us that she goes to place spices on the body to prepare it for burial. She comes out of duty and what? Out of love in order to do what must be done. When she arrives, she finds that the stone has been removed. This would have been a big shock, wouldn't have it? What could it possibly mean? She may have been afraid that grave robbers had entered the tomb or worse, political foes who might have entered to desecrate the body or perhaps desecrate the tomb. So before investigating for herself, she runs immediately to Peter and to someone else. Of course, she goes to the disciple that Jesus loved. His close friend who tradition has it was the apostle John, the one who would be instrumental in writing the gospel from which this account is taken. Mary nor the disciples themselves had a concept at that moment of what was really going on here. They suspected the worst, as you might think if you were in the same situation. You can imagine the faithful John running as fast as he can. Once he finds out, he far outstrips Peter. We always think of Peter as being the impetuous one, don't we? But here is John running headlong toward possible danger because of his love for Jesus and running so fast that he arrives without any help that he might have been in need of had there been grave robbers there or had there been maybe even Roman soldiers. When they both finally arrive at the tomb, Peter and John see the strips of linen that have been wrapped around the body of Jesus neatly stacked on the resting place. And looking at those neatly stacked bundles, they immediately come to the conclusion that this could not possibly have been a hasty robbery or a desecration of the tomb. No, such neatness, such deliberate action is evidence of something else, something amazing perhaps, something for which they dared not hope, something which they could barely understand that some way, somehow, there is a remote chance that Jesus is alive, but it's too slim an evidence upon which to make a determination. So they immediately go back to the place where they were staying, no doubt, to tell the other disciples what they had seen. Well, Peter and John had made their deductions, and now that they had already left, 
The real evidence. They didn't stay long enough to get the real evidence. The real evidence comes in. And who is it for? It comes to Mary Magdalene. For here is Mary crying outside the tomb. She is, she's returned after Peter and John have left. Two strangers appear to Mary. In fact, they are angels. And they take pity on Mary, who is no doubt bewildered, no doubt shaken. For she has a great love for Jesus, who had cured her of mental distress, and whom she recognized as her teacher and as the Son of God. The angels try to comfort her, but she is inconsolable. She cries, her eyes fill with tears. The angels depart the scene. And then she sees another figure, one that she does not recognize through her tears. She thinks it is the groundskeeper. In her error, she begs the supposed gardener to lead her to the body of Jesus, if only he knows where it is. In this dramatic moment, we know this man, but Mary cannot see him. She is literally blinded because of her love. It is none other than Jesus whom she cannot see through her tears. And we imagine Jesus in his pity and love for this woman say her name, Mary, Mary. The voice of Jesus, though, is so familiar. She's heard the man preaching. She's heard him conversing with the apostles. She has heard him addressing her in terms of comfort and hope. It is that voice saying her name that finally clues her in. She knows it is Jesus. She turns to him with heart swelling and cries out, Rabboni, teacher. He is the master and she is the student, the disciple, Christ. She's overcome to such a degree that she grabs onto him and holds him because of her love and joy. And now you see the intensity of the emotion that she has for Jesus. You see how she cannot restrain herself with bonds of decorum. You see how she loves the Lord at this moment. And as we stand or sit here listening to this story, we try to put ourselves in the ecstatic state that Mary is in, that what she must have been experiencing at that moment. Yes, we love Jesus. Yes, we love God. But can we claim to have that emotion, those feelings, with such a degree of intensity that they seem to warrant? We try and we fail. We want to love God with the emotion that Mary feels. We want the tears to flow and our hearts to pound. We want to know the intense love of God and we want to respond with our own intense love. But can we reach that ideal? What is in us that makes it so hard? Is it the distance of time, some 2,000 years? Is it the skepticism instilled in us by a society that puts a high value on factoids and disregards and denigrates faith? Are we like Thomas? Do we need to place our hands in the side of Jesus before we can believe and shout exuberantly, my Lord and my God? Would touching Christ's wounds even be enough? Do we have to go to the extremes of glory or tragedy to be moved to such a degree? My friends, it is a hard question but one that I think needs answers. How do we truly feel the love? We have a direct line to the most powerful force in the universe, the love of God. Yet every day we squander this, our greatest opportunity. I have thought often on this question. My short answer, yeah, is that it is a project that is somewhat difficult to undertake, but a project
object that needs to be taken. We have to break down the barriers in our minds and the barriers that we are ever building up in our hearts. We have to build up, we've built up over time so many defenses that we cannot bear to let them down. We have so many fears that have been with us for so long that we end up cherishing them, loving them. We have to put them aside. We have to let ourselves be vulnerable, vulnerable for just a moment and let in the love of God. Yet, this is not something I think we can do all at once. We do this first by following Christ's example. Practicing Christ's radical love for one another. It begins when we smile at one another on Easter morning and say, He is risen. But we have to go even further, forgiving faults, disregarding slights, giving more than we receive. This is like being like the Master. And we do this not just with our fellow church members, but with everyone in our community. We must always remember that we are made in the image of God and so is everyone else. Yeah, we are made in the image of God. That's right. And so is everyone else. That's the hard thing to remember sometimes. And loving each other is part of what we do when we love God. Sounds easy enough when you say it out loud, doesn't it? But my friends, it is one of the hardest things that you will ever do. Love is all about giving up the self. How do we forget our self-interest? How do we stop and think how everything we do can be turned to our own advantage? How do we find the energy to run to the tomb of Jesus? How do we cry at his death and become overjoyed at his rising. Well, we all know who the master of giving up the self is. It is Jesus Christ. Mary and John were fortunate to have Jesus with them right there as an example. That's what we're thinking, right? But we too have Jesus with us every minute of every hour of every day. Jesus gave fully of himself out of love for us. It is his sacrifice that saves us. So to feel the love, the love of God, and the love of each other, it follows that we must become disciples of the Master and give of ourselves in radical ways. I don't mean necessarily money or things, but of time and talents, and ultimately from our hearts and souls. But love is not just about giving, but being able to accept love as well. That is one of the hard things to do, isn't it? To accept gifts from others, to accept love from others. Jesus accepted the love of his followers. He accepts our love. So do not close yourself off from friends and neighbors. Or sometimes receiving what others have to give is also a gift to the giver. In the end of our reading, Jesus sends Mary back to the disciples. It is Mary Magdalene, the one who feels so intensely, who is the first to truly announce the good news to the disciples and thus to the world. It is her great commission. She tells them, I have seen the Lord. And then she tells the disciples the things that Jesus has said. And this is another thing that disciples do. Through God's love, she conveys God's word. Perhaps this is the greatest gift that we can give to anyone, the greatest gift we can give to any other, and especially those who do not yet believe. So I am thinking in all of this, we may find that it is in our interaction with God and with each other as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
discipleship. That is the key, I think, to maybe opening up ourselves, inside of ourselves. That is how we come, finally, to feel the love of God. Amen. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him. This is our Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust in him to share this feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give the Lord our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with the choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God, and blessed is Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread and after giving thanks, he broke it saying, this is my body that is for you. As often as you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, given for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Now if you will take your cracker or your piece of bread, break off a piece, this is the body of Christ given for you. Now 
Now, if you will take your wine or your juice, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Now please join with me in prayer. God of grace, you renew us at your table with the bread of life. May this food strengthen us in love and help us to serve you as we help one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. posture for prayer. Heavenly Lord, you have risen from the grave. You are our Savior, our rock, our life, our all. You love us with an intensity beyond anything that we might muster, but we honor and worship you with all the capacity of our frail hearts. We give thanks that you accept our love and return it in abundance. Praise to you, O Lord. Lord, we pray for those who do not know you, who can only glimpse you through the creation and the joy that engenders it engenders in their hearts. Lord, reveal your true self to them through your word, in your mercy. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly, eternal God, we pray for those who are unable to come to your table because of illness, poverty, oppression, or dire circumstance. We ask you to heal your people, make light their burdens, and shower upon them the abundance of your loving grace in your mercy. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask that you continue to be with those in the front lines in the battle against crime, disease, war, and famine. Lord, hear our prayer. Please lift up your private prayers and petitions to the Lord at this time. Lord, hear our prayers. Now let us pray in the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom power and the glory now and forever. Amen. in the 
My friends, go from here renewed and strong, knowing the Lord is alive, almighty, and present. Look for the blessings that await you this week. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who celebrate. Tell the story of hope. Now may the truth of the empty tomb, the astonishing reality of Jesus' resurrection, keep you fearless and sure. May the power of God's endless love surround you and guide you this day and always. Amen. Amen.